Hi friends, this is John, and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about agronomic science and cultural management practices that regenerate plant health, soil health, and ultimately also regenerate public health. Today, I have a guest on the podcast that I've been wanting to have for some time. When I was introduced to him the first time, or told about him the first time, I was told that this individual is the senior grandfather of microbial fungi research and developing disease suppressive soils, and that very few people, fewer people know about him and deserve to know about him. So today I'm excited to have Dr. Robert Linderman from the USDA here from Corvallis, Oregon. Bob, thank you very much for agreeing to be here and sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom. I'd love to hear more about your story and background. How did you come to do all the research that you've done in developing disease suppressive soils and with mycorrhizal fungi associations. Tell us a little bit about your story and your background and how you came to this spot. Well, thank you very much, John. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my history goes back a long ways, as, as you already know. I started out as a zoologist, a pre-med student. I went to Fresno State College and became interested in plants, actually, along the way went to graduate school, eventually went to graduate school at UC Berkeley and worked with some world-renowned people on diseases and pathogens. And in 1967, I graduated from there and went to the USDA ARS research facility in Bellsville, Maryland. And there were people there that I got to know, but one of them happened to be a person interested in mycorrhizal fungi, and I got to thinking about mycorrhizal fungi in a broader context and kind of became a student of that at that time. But then I was transferred to Corvallis, Oregon, where there were other world-renowned researchers on working on mycorrhizal fungi, and I was still a student of that subject. And it just kind of went from there. I began to study it and say, well, this is one of the most important components of the, the rhizosphere of plants that would infect, affect plant diseases, especially root diseases. And it kind of went from there. I got, began to study all the interactions that occur in that zone next to the roots and became interested in the concept of the potential of biological control to control those pathogens in that zone right next to the roots and on the roots. So the rest of my career kind of related to that, and, and I addressed the specific pathogens on nursery crops but always had the idea that some of those pathogens could be controlled rather than with chemicals. They could be controlled with biological systems. It's a matter of how to develop and find the systems and make them work. And that's been kind of a struggle for well, ever since. There's a certain reluctance to consider the concept of biological control by many growers, because they already have their systems kind of worked out and they kind of know, and then there's a lot of chemicals that people can sell them that would address certain diseases. And so they kind of push aside the idea of biological control. Well, that's all changing in current times because there are more concern about chemicals being used from both a standpoint of human health as well as damage and impact on the environment. So there are a lot of companies that have kind of shifted a little bit into biological control developing products, and there are a lot of biological control products out there. I think the real problem is those people that are, might want to consider biological control really don't know how to get started. And the key is try to, in my opinion, is not to necessarily try to change the whole biology of the soil, but to change the biology of the soil right next to the roots and on the roots. So that means prevent the disease before it ever happens. And that's kind of the thrust of everything that I am thinking now and things that I've done. And that includes mycorrhizal fungi and the organisms that associate with them in sort of a team effort to potentially suppress pathogens and enhance plant growth and health. And that's kind of where I am right now. I retired from the USDA in 2007, so I've been retired for almost 13 years. I'm a private consultant right now with nurseries working on these various things that we're talking about, trying to have the nursery people be able to control diseases that they get. And as we talked the other day, the potential for field crops where transplants are being used 
is still part of the nursery industry. We could manage those populations on the roots of soil of plants in the nursery before they ever go to the field, and that's kind of a concept that we could explore further. And I'll stop talking there, and maybe we can go to some questions that you have. Well, there's no shortage of questions that I have for you, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so just some of the things that you've mentioned in your quick introduction, a number of pieces that you brought up that I want to dive a bit deeper on, but let's perhaps start with the question of if you are a commercial grower and you have a desire to develop disease suppressive soils and to manage some of the pathogens that you have challenges with a given crop, how do you begin? Where's the start? Where's the starting point? And, and how can you, there's also a lot of questions about the broad range of biocontrol products that's available, which are effective, which are not effective. We know it's very context dependent. So how do you make the decisions about what to choose and where do you begin? Well, let's just say you're a grower with uh, some specific disease problem you have to consider the products that are out there available to you right now that would address those pathogens, that specific disease. I'll just look at your list and think of some of the kinds of things like, well, just say fusarium, or rhizo let's go to rhizoctonia. How could you control rhizoctonia? You have to ask the question, how and when does rhizoctonia get in to cause the disease? Is it present in the field soil that you're gonna plant into? And if so, it would be a good idea to be able to take a product where the label says this organism or series of organisms works to control for rhizoctonia. And then it's a matter of delivering that product to the site where it needs to be to work in a timely way. That is before the pathogen ever gets to the root. So that means pre-inoculation, or that means inoculating a transplant or inoculating a bulb, an onion bulb, so that there's already a pop. It's like immunizing the plant before it ever gets exposed to the pathogen. So any grower can then look at the label, and sometimes the labels are going to be maybe inclusive of the pathogen that you're considering. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work on the strain of the pathogen that you are faced with in your soil. So there's that kind of specificity that can be a problem. So the real way test that, and there are not many people doing this kind of thing, would be to isolate the pathogen that you have in your field and test it against the, the product that you're going to be using. You can do that in a petri dish test, or you can develop some other kind of a plant bioassay that simulates what would happen in the field. I'll take an example. There's a product called triathlon. The label says it'll work against rhizoctonia, fusarium, phytophthora, pythium, about five different pathogens. The question would be whether or not that product has enough of whatever works against rhizoctonia to actually do the job. If you load the plant system up in advance of being exposed to the rhizoctonia, then you have the best chance of succeeding. And that's where most growers are not quite in tune to the timing of the whole thing and where to put the material and when. And sometimes it doesn't do any good to add the product to a big volume because the population doesn't maintain itself in the right place at the right time to do the suppression of the pathogen. So the grower needs to consider all those kinds of things when developing a product. Maybe there is no product that controls the pathogen that you're concerned with. For example, I'm not really sure macrophamina is the pathogen that causes charcoal rot. Are there products out there already that would be addressing that pathogen? I can't actually that. I could look it up, but I don't really know the answer right now. But let's say there isn't one. There are ways, and this is back to the paper I just mentioned earlier to you, John, about strategies for finding and characterizing biocontrol agents. You could go to the field and look for examples where somehow the pathogen didn't do its job and there's a, ex escapes. You may be able to isolate a pathogen and its antagonist from that field and then develop that. Well, somebody has to do that commercially in order for you to do it. The farmer's not going to be able to do it themselves. That ends up being a problem, and that's kind of where we are right now. We may not have the specifics that are needed for that particular strain of the pathogen in that specific field. At that point, that's where some farmers will say, it's too complicated, it's too much trouble, and I don't have anybody to go to to help find that organism and develop it. And so they go to chemicals as the, the best choice they have or some product that they might try to see if it works. 
Bob, you've hinted that timing of product application is really important and that my understanding is that it needs to be applied before the potential pathogen actually produces an infection. Is it necessary always to apply materials at planting or even before planting in order to produce the control effect that we're looking for? Well, for sure, uh, and they're really good examples of why this is really essential, but in almost every case that I can think of, to get the, the protection there before the pathogen gets there should be the best thing, no matter what. The question is, depending how the farmer farms and whether seeding or transplanting or planting bulbs or whatever, to treat that material where the infection is going to happen, to have something there waiting for the pathogen when it tries to get into the plant is the best chance. It's like immunizing a child for infections that might come. You build up some kind of resistance, and the resistance is in biological form. If you wait until the pathogen already has started, it's pretty hard to chase it down. It's like closing the gate after the cows are out. It's just a hard hard thing to do and maybe totally successful. And that's, in fact, the outcome for many people. I tried that material, but it didn't work. Well, when did you put it on or where did you put it? I can give you an example of the mycorrhizal fungi, for example. Did you put it on the root system or where the roots would run into it? No. I put the fungus in a Gandhi spreader and spread it over the field on the top. Well, it needed to be down where the roots were. So if you failed, that's good reason for it. You didn't put it where it needed to be in a timely way. And the same would be true with any biocontrol agents. And, of course, there are ways of building up, uh, and this is a point to make, too, Almost all soils have some antagonistic organisms to most pathogens. They're just there in too low a population to do what they need to do in a, in a timely and effective way. But if you can find them, build them up to a higher population so they dominate the site that infections are going to occur in, then you have a good chance. The disease called crown gall is a bacterium. You must use the biocontrol agent to protect the wounds that that pathogen gets in. That's the normal way it gets in. And if you don't protect the wounds, then you get crown gall. It's as simple as that. And so you just have to find the organism, put it in the right place at the right time to prevent the disease. The key for me in all of these things is prevention. Prevent the disease before it ever happens. And that's the same concept with immunization. You prevent the disease from occurring. Bob, so far we've been having this conversation in the context or in framing it around the use of commercial products, which are valuable and necessary tools, and more of them are being developed and going through the registration process all the time. So what are the cultural management strategies or cultural management practices that growers can use to enhance the development of disease-suppressive organisms in their soil profiles and shift their soil profile from one that favors the expression of pathogens to one that suppresses it? Well, there are certain substrates that you can add uh, to soil that will at least increase the biological diversity. Assuming that the biology in the soil, there are some components that are there that could be effective in the biocontrol process. If you build them up in population, you're, I mean, you put some of the organic matter, for example, in the soil or chitin in the soil, you build up specific organisms that like that substrate, like the actinomycetes, like chitin because they can produce the, an enzyme that breaks it down. So that population of organisms will build up specifically or preferentially on a chitin substrate. Other organisms don't like chitin so much, they're not going to build up very much. So you can kind of shift the population in your favor in that particular case. But adding organic matter in general will increase the microbial diversity of the soil and there'll be a greater population of organisms that could suppress the pathogen, but they're also there competing with everything else that like that substrate, that compost, organic matter. And so it's difficult to favor the biocontrol agents that you want and with a general amendment like that. And you can kind of get to the idea that if you have a greater diversity and then you have some selective pressure that allows those organisms that you want to be recruited from the population and given preferential treatment, then you've shifted the population in favor of the organisms that you want. 
And one of the things that does this, and you've read the paper I sent you on the mycorrhizosphere, but when you have mycorrhiza on a plant, they help recruit antagonistic organisms from the background soil so that the population of antagonists in the presence of mycorrhiza is greater than if you don't have mycorrhizae. So that's one way of preferentially shifting the population to something that you want, a team of organisms that some of which are antagonists to, to a, a range of pathogens. And what builds up against one pathogen is not necessarily the ones that build up against another pathogen, but the concept of mycorrhiza mycorrhizal association stimulating antagonistic organisms in general, thereby increasing the antagonistic potential against a range of path soilborne pathogens is very good. We have growers that we're working with for producing very high value crops and as fumigation becomes less and less of a viable commercial option, many people are asking the question, what is the fastest route that we can take there's no holds barred. Budget is not a limitation. We're willing to do whatever it takes to develop soils that can suppress these organisms. What's the pathway that you would advise them to use? What's the combination of cultural management practices and products that they should use to achieve the optimal results? And we can use fusarium in soils as an example, or a fusarium in strawberries, or macrothamina. I'm not working specifically with those, but I think you have to, uh, even if you were to choose a biological product and you add that in a system where there's a population potential to be built up by some organic substrate, that is, you, you could add organisms and favor them by having some food material there to build up a population of them in advance of planting. That would be the key. And, of course, the other thing where we, you and I have talked before about, and you've written a lot about improving soil health, that's one way you can increase the microbial diversity and, therefore, the soil health. But if you wanted to really increase the population next to the root system where the pathogen is about to in, uh, invade, then you probably need to inoculate the propagule of the, of the plant or put the organism right where the roots of that plant will come in contact with it very quickly. That could be a drench of organisms, some product, for example, uh, right into the system where the plant is going to have to grow, where the roots will develop. And if they get to associated with the root system, wherever the root system goes, the organisms will follow it. They'll stay with it, unless you do something that's pretty drastic, and sometimes those treatments are drastic. They may also be trying for biological control but in, uh, give up on that or decide to add some chemicals that may put the whole system on hold or suppress it. I'm not sure I got to the right answer there, uh, what you were you're specifically asking. There's no, you have talked a lot in your blog about the uh, fertil fertility and the kinds of changes that would occur with different kinds of fertility, and there are surely ex examples where that kind of approach has shifted the population in such a way that antagonists are favored. Uh, there's an example on wheat take all, for example, here in Oregon. Uh, Bob Powell, some many years ago, found out that potassium chloride could be added and shift the population toward antagonistic pseudomonads. There are other people that have done the same kind of thing with seed meals and things like that. And you increase the antagonistic population then you get less disease. What will be happening specifically with macrophamina on strawberries or any other crop, uh, I'm not even sure I know the, I don't know the answer to that, but there could be uh, certain cover crops that might favor the buildup of antagonist, and you need to be able to measure the change in antagonistic potential as a result of whatever you did, whether it was plant a different cover crop uh, there are examples where certain crops favor the buildup of antagonists against the, the uh, pathogen that was going to occur on the next plant. Those kinds of things are probably known, but not necessarily known by the farmers that are going to try to practice it unless their their fathers or grandfathers told them this is the right way to do it. Surely many of those stories out there. 
there are so many of those stories out there, and this is exactly <laughs> this is exactly the type of conversation that I've been hoping to have with people and to draw out because the story, the example you just shared of using potassium chloride to increase the antagonists for a pickle disease in wheat, there are there are so many cultural management practices that are known collectively by people in agriculture and horticulture to how to control a specific disease organism in a specific context. But with cultural management practice, I would consider this a cultural management practice, using tools, using specific forms of nutrients and um, right. specific types of products to shift the soil microbial profile is is knowledge that is out there, but it's not common knowledge. It's become, well, vested interests, I believe, have, uh, and, and just human nature, it's been easy to just buy a product in a jug as in a, a fungicide or something like that and go fix the problem. Right. In reality, we, we have the collective knowledge amongst us to prevent a lot of these problems from showing up in the first place if only it were more widely known. Well, all these things are kind of specific examples, and so it's really difficult to find one common denominator that would apply to many systems. That is, what cover crop would build up antagonists to a specific pathogen, whatever the problem is. You mentioned the other day a Phytophthora problem on peppers, I guess it was. You have to know what the strain of the pathogen is and what that field of soil history is, and I don't think they, there's anybody collected all the information on any specific crop as to what cover crop you should be used to prevent such and such a disease. It's known in some cases, but not a lot. And frankly, the, the emphasis by research people and farmers and agronomists, horticulturists, has not been to find those organisms and develop that strategy or that a protocol for growing your crop. Unfortunately, I think the information could be there, but it's buried a little bit in all kinds of literature or no literature. I can tell you yeah. the potassium chloride story, for example, on take-all was not published in a referee journal paper. It was something was either in an abstract or some local thing, and I happened to hear about it because I knew, the, I knew Bob Powelson. But those kinds of things are sort of buried in the literature, and that's a really unfortunate kind of thing in my own case, too. I've published papers that are buried in referee journals, but the farmer never sees them. How do you get that material translated and put into a language that somebody can read easily and say, this this is how I'm going to approach it, or talk to somebody who, who will guide them through that? And I'm not sure there are that many people out there that would be in that category. What are some examples of some of the papers that you've written and that you think farmers would really value knowing about but that, that aren't widely known? Uh, that's a hard question because, I mean, I kind of know what the papers are. I, I went through a process fairly recently since I'd worked on using onions as a test organism for mycorrhizal fungi for many more papers. I decided those papers were all buried in the scientific literature, and maybe I should collect them and summarize some of those papers and put it in the journal called Onion World, where the farmers would actually read it, hopefully. Well, I published that paper and it went into Onion World, but then I have no idea whether the onion growers actually read it. And that's the, I know that this is where you might have come from, too, because you're involved in, in this process we're going through right now, plus your blog, to try and translate and transmit some of that information to growers who need it right now. They need to have it translated. They need to have it put into perspective that they can understand and try to apply. And I don't think there's a lot of that kind of thing. There's not enough of that happening. Well, it's it certainly, there's many days for me when it appears to be an, an almost overwhelming task because when you start getting into some of these papers, you, you I become extremely excited by the implications of connecting the dots, what a piece of research or a certain paper means when we connect it to the rest of the knowledge base that is out there. But then you start following the bibliography, and all of a sudden you discover that this paper cites an additional 100 other papers, of which 20 appear to be really exceptional. And it's Absolutely. just an, an ever-expanding list with, with no end. <laughs> well, I'm hearing what you say, and I, I totally agree. And you asked earlier what paper, or even ones that I've published, that I 
could point to that might be something that would tease uh, growers into thinking about biological control systems. And the paper I just mentioned on strategies for detecting and characterizing biocontrol systems for soil-borne pathogens is probably one that that would maybe get growers, if they read that paper, to look down there and say, oh, here's an example. I've got crown gall, or I've, I've got take all, or I've got root rot of beans. Uh, and there's some grower people that I, we referred to in that paper that did such and such. They grew certain crops before beans. Well, I've never done that, so maybe that's something to try. But it gets them thinking about how they can figure out what parts and what strategy they need to use for their specific crop. And, of course, there are farmers that grow different crops. I mean, in your area, the, a lot of corn and soybeans are grown, but there are also all kinds of vegetable crops and pumpkins and, you know, on and on. Then you have to consider the specifics of the pathogen. And that's where a lot of people will get off because they're talking to agronomists and horticulturists maybe and not necessarily working with a pathologist that can deliver some specifics about the pathogen and what they need to consider. There are pathologists that are out there in your areas. that, that oh, Don Huber is a really good example of somebody who knows those crops and knows those systems. You have to talk to them, but there's a few Don Hubers out there. I want to say that there are very few people who take a systemic approach, and I'm coming to realize that there are many people actually who do take a very systemic approach to trying to understand these problems, but they are still in the great minority. It's still very easy. One of the challenges of the scientific method being brought into agriculture has been the easy method of doing research is to attempt to do single factor analysis, identify a specific factor, change it, and observe what happens. And of course, agricultural ecosystems are extraordinarily multifactorial. There's so many different factors that all work together and collaborate in, in these systems, things that we don't even fully understand yet. And within that context, our conversation to some degree, we've been talking a little bit about systems, we've been talking about cultural management practices and products and so forth. But I'd love to hear a specific example. Let's say we're dealing with phytophthora issues on a specific crop. What are all the different tools or combinations of tools that you could bring into a system to all try to have an influence on phytophthora? We can apply specific products. We can grow cover crops in advance of the crop. What are some other things that we can do? And also, parallel to that question is, are there combinations of products that we should consider trying? Uh, Fomal inoculants combined with bacterial inoculants combined with biosimilants and so forth. What is this, a true systemic approach to solving the issue rather than just taking a single factor point and shoot approach? Let me point you to that paper we're talking about on strategies and refer you to the system called the Ashburner system in Australia. Phytophthora so root rot on avocados. Ashburner was a farmer who knew he had phytophthora, and his neighbors had phytophthora. And right next to his fields were the rainforest areas, and what was and the phytophthora was there, but it never caused any disease. What was different about those two systems? And Ashburner decided he was going to bring that system into his orchard. So he started growing a cover crop of a material called Lab Lab, and he didn't just chop it up and work it into the soil. He, he chopped it and laid it over and built up a thick layer of this around his trees. And he added lime. The system is described in that paper, by the way. That's what I'm saying. And Ashburner basically brought his trees back into production by that whole system. Now, he didn't understand or know all the other components that were in it. He didn't know anything about mycorrhizal fungi, which could have been involved. But these suppressive soils, he created suppressive soils, and the suppressiveness had to do with organisms that would suppress the development of zoospores of the pathogen. Well, if the pathogen doesn't develop zoospores that swim to the roots and infect it, then you don't get root infection. Pretty soon you have enough roots that are healthy and being protected to sustain the tree, and those trees came back to production, and he, was, he went on his merry way. He did that whole system for, for that, from that point on. And there are other people that have examples that I've referred to in that paper where they've done this for years and years, and they don't have bean root rot, for example, or they don't have crown gall. 
each case you mentioned the phytophthora on pepper uh, what would have to be done to build up the antagonistic potential of that field over time that could be a real problem because the, the grower may grow peppers one year and decide well okay I had a lot of disease I'm not going to grow peppers there anymore so it's not like you have a sustained build up like you would with take all decline something systemic and when you get down to the whole thing, with a few exceptions, and most all the plants on the earth form mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi for me have become the, the key component. And we still don't have people inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi, even though they may be the orchestrator of really good things to come, including building up antagonistic potential. Not only mentioning the increase in uptake of phosphorus and other nutrients, those kinds of things are what people talk about, but there's a whole shift in in the biology of a plant internally and externally if you have mycorrhizal fungi. And that includes building up antagonists, nitrogen fixers, but not many people are studying it, so we don't really know all the things that could be happening as a result of forming mycorrhizae, and you have to do it early. It's, again, the same with the, the protection against pathogens. You have to get it there before or as early as you can, and that means how and when I can apply the organism or that product to get mycorrhizae established as early as possible to therefore benefit thereafter. We just don't have enough products and people doing that. You could be inoculating, and this is back to what do you inoculate? Well, in my case, with cut, I can inoculate cuttings. I want to sanitize the cuttings and then pre, then inoculate them with beneficial organisms like antagonistic organisms just to prevent it against a specific disease. But if you were to take the whole package, mycorrhiza fungus plus all the associated organisms, some of which, many of which might be antagonistic to pathogens, that would be a good approach, a good systemic approach. But it's an expense. And many growers are probably looking at that expense and saying, well, I don't know if that's going to be worth it or not. And so they almost talk themselves out of trying it. You know what I find interesting about the comment that you just made is uh, this last week I was at an event in Iowa. And corn growers, I've lost my uh, desire to I enjoy working with corn less than I do with other crops. I'll just state that in a very kind way because of, the agronomic approach that is so commonly taken. What I found so intriguing is that growers have become so locked into a system, they know that they're going to lose money when they plant corn seed in the ground. They know that's a foregone conclusion. And yet, they, uh, in the week that I was there, they were considering planning the following week to go out and put on a $40 an acre fungicide application that is completely unwarranted. There is no need for it. There are no pathogens present. There is no disease present, and there's none in the forecast particularly. But the only reason they're putting it on is because they've been told they need it so that they don't lose any more money than they're already losing. And so I find that approach, that way of thinking about product applications, what if we were to think about our biological products that way? What if we were to think about mycorrhizal fungi and I think that I can't afford not to put these on, otherwise I might lose more money than I'm already losing. Anyway, that was just a, a kind of a twisted reality. It made me think that uh, I might have gone through the looking glass, so to speak, and have been in a very different world. And that also, um, before we go on to other topics, I wanted to, for all of our listeners, I'll be sharing the paper that Bob has referenced a couple of times. I've read it several times over the years, and I'm really fascinated by the Ashburner example that is described in this paper because the way that it's defined and described is quite interesting. In the paper, it's described as developing a mulch layer on the soil surface to foster the development of microbial communities and also to supply abundant calcium and then a very key phrase, to supply all the nitrogen in the form of ammonium. Right. That, to me, means the presence of a reducing environment in the soil profile, not an oxidizing environment. It's all part of the system. It's all part of the system. At all, I'm not sure. All, I, that aspect, I'm not sure how Ashburner thought that through and developed the system. 
actually Ken Baker, who was one of the co-authors on the paper, he was one of my professors at Berkeley, he actually knew Ashburner and had been to Mount Tambourine and seen the system. And by the way, have had slides, aerial slides over his farm that show his farm next to the neighbor's farms and his trees were growing and theirs weren't and other aspects of that. There were certain things that Ashburner didn't know anything about. For example, in that layer that he built up as a mulch, he developed humic materials near the surface. The most decomposed, there were more humic materials there. Well, what's the role of humic materials in the whole process in terms of nutrients and in terms of organisms and the whole thing? That you know, what, what was the mycorrhizal status of the avocado trees? Were the, Did they become in colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, and therefore they attracted some of the antagonists that would suppress the pathogen. That part wasn't known either. But the system worked. That's the beauty of it. His system worked. That's and really he was the farmer that, that got there. He, he probably didn't, I don't know if he read scientific papers, but he, he heard and talked to other people like Ken Pegg over there and got some advice on the what putting calcium in there and liming the soil. And, and not, don't just chop up the organic matter, but just lay it over and build up this thick layer around the trees. That was a nifty system. Now, how many orchards could be doing that? But right now, we're orchards on the soil surface. They're, they're clean. They use herbicides. They use all kinds of things to make it easier for them to get a tractor in there, I guess. But Ashburner, got, uh, he was able to pick avocados, but he probably couldn't get a tractor through around the tree because of the mulch, which he didn't want to disturb. So the, the farmer has to kind of consider a whole bunch of things, and each case is individual. If you were to go into depth and say, okay, here's a farmer that has phytophthora capsaicy on peppers, what is the cultural practice that they're using right now, and what could be changed to reduce the incidence of that disease if they wanted to grow peppers there? They could go out a year or two and grow a cover crop of something that would build up antagonistic organisms to that particular pathogen, they may or may not be willing to do that just because of the economics. Corn growers know they're going to lose money, as you just said, and so they put something on as insurance, and there are all kinds of people put things on as insurance against an accident that may never happen or may the potential for it to happen might not have even been there. They spend and, a lot of money doing that. And the key they need point... something else and say, well, why don't you spend your money some other way you and I might try to convince them that to go a biological way would be better than putting a chemical on that would do nothing but disappear, not have any effect on anything except screw up the populations of something. Yeah, it actually has a negative effect instead of a positive effect on the overall system, over particularly over time. You've touched on mycorrhizae, and you've mentioned how they recruit antagonistic organisms that suppress pathogens. And I think the conversation around... Uh, mycorrhizal fungi, solubilizing phosphorus, and increasing phosphorus supply and so forth is becoming a fairly well-known conversation. But this uh, interaction and this effect of them being a recruiting agent, if you will, is not as widely known. Can you expand on that a little bit more and tell us more about what's happening and what's going on? I'd love to expand on it. The two papers I sent you also have to do with that very concept, the mycorrhizosphere concept. And while those papers are complicated for many people to read, the concepts is pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, the only place that I published that information was in those two chapters. They were talks that I gave, and I've included information there on increasing the antagonistic potential in the presence of mycorrhiza that didn't happen in the absence of mycorrhiza. That's the key point. And while most people think about mycorrhizae in terms of phosphorus uptake potential, uh, that's only part of the story. And this other part is maybe even more important. The same with mycorrhizal fungi increasing the aggregation in soil that improves the tilt of the soil. That's not so widely appreciated. But this idea of recruiting organisms from a background to build up populations at a high enough level to suppress the pathogen so the antagonistic potential is increased, that should be a good thing in all cases. We ran about six or seven different pathogens, and in each case the antagonistic potential was increased against each of those pathogens, but the organisms that might have been involved for one pathogen wouldn't necessarily be the ones that are involved for another pathogen. 
but collectively the antagonistic potential overall in that assay system, which also was never published, was increased. So that's kind of a general statement. You can increase the antagonistic potential of any of its pathogens by having mycorrhiza present to begin with. So you put that's the mycorrhiza in, the organisms are there, they come running and they get recruited to the team, and then if you do that enough, you have increased the antagonistic potential of the soil. So when you plant your next crop, there are more antagonists that are there to keep the pathogen from doing anything or doing much. Fundamentally, what you're describing is that if you are successful, when you are successful in developing robust mycorrhizal populations, then in reality, we don't even need to know all of the specific antagonists or specific diseases, that oh, those can be recruited from the soil, and we just we develop a general resistance as a result of the mycorrhizal recruitment. Well, let me just say what the technique was that we developed. If you had a mycorrhizal a soil from around the mycorrhizal system versus control without mycorrhizae, we isolated 48 different-looking bacteria from the, those two systems, and then we challenged that with a pathogen. We used the Laviopsis black root rot pathogen as a test organism. And then we looked at the zones of inhibition around each of the bacterial colonies that were on there. And we could evaluate and come to what we call the antagonistic potential index, which was a reflection of all the organisms. We didn't know what they were. They could have been lots of the same organism, but the antagonistic potential and still potential tested, but the potential to suppress pathogen was greatly increased in the presence of mycorrhizae as opposed to the absence of mycorrhizae. So it didn't make any difference, what the, but these were all bacteria, by the way, and that's one-sided in the sense of there could also be antagonistic fungi, which we did not measure in those tests. But let's just say there's trichodermas there, too, and trichodermas can have the same kind of effect. Well, if you did the same kind of an assay to measure the antagonistic potential, Against the specific pathogen, this is the strain that's in that field, then it doesn't really make a difference what the organisms are. You can say that that pathogen will be suppressed by that population of organisms in the mycorrhizal sphere. It's really kind of a fundamental concept, but needs to be tested. And by the way, most laboratories, with only one exception that I know of, ever even tried to measure antagonistic potential and put a number on it. It used to be a lab in Southern California, that uh, BBC labs that used to do that. You send them your pathogen, they can look at the soil and find out what the antagonistic potential is, whatever the treatment was in the soil. Are there more antagonists against that pathogen than not? Well, they give you a, a high, low, and medium number. We actually try to actually count them, and we did that based on the zone of inhibition around the bacterial colony once we oversprayed with the pathogen. You take canidia of, of the Laviopsis, for example, spray over the whole plate, find out those bacterial colonies that showed a zone of inhibition where the, the spores didn't germinate, you know what I'm saying, a zone of inhibition, and you can count all the population on that plate and the size of the zone of inhibition come up with the antagonist potential index. When we consider the implications of what you are describing and the capacity that mycorrhizae have as a recruiting agent, in essence, we've known that they were a very important foundational species to manage well, and this just emphasizes that to an even greater degree. And I think this should lead us to ask questions that you are perhaps uniquely qualified to answer, which is what is the best way to inoculate and develop and maintain a mycorrhizal population? There are lots of questions about tillage. Can I till my soils? And how do I maintain a mycorrhizal population or redevelop it in a tilled soil environment? How do I establish a mycorrhizal population in an orchard system where the trees are 10 years old and I want to keep them for another 20 years or longer? So I think there's lots of questions about how we manage mycorrhizae in some of these different environments that there are many people who have the questions and few who seem to have good answers. What are your thoughts? Well, the first question that comes with any of the crops, are, do they already have mycorrhizae? I mean, tree crops that are growing or grapevines that are growing. If they don't have mycorrhizae already, they're not growing. I mean, grapes can't survive without mycorrhizal fungi. So then the question is, do I have to add more 
or and would it do any good if I added more? Well, the answer to that could be probably not. But the idea of establishing mycorrhiza when you transplant into that grapevine, into that, if they're already inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, so they're already mycorrhizal to begin with, that's the best you could hope for. Inoculate at the time we transplant. And if you can't inoculate the transplant, then when you transplant, at least put the inoculum in the soil, in the hole, where the roots are going to run into it right away. That's really all you can do. You can't put it on the top of the soil and hope it's going to wash down. Some of it will. You can put some of it on seed because some of it will wash off the seed and get to the roots, not as efficiently as bacteria would, like rhizobium. You can put that on the seed. But that's another way of delivering if that's the kind of crop. You're not doing a transplant. You're doing seeding. If you're going to do seed, put it on the seed in high enough population that enough of it will wash down the root system or put it right under the seed. That's the only advice that I can give to people as far as mycorrhizal fungi, and then then manage the kind of fertility that will favor the development of mycorrhizae. Don't put a lot of phosphorus fertilizer on and suppress them. This leads me to two follow-up questions that you just described, which the first question is if you have an established system and you ask the question, do they are they already colonized by mycorrhizae? My question would be, how can we establish that? How can we know that? Are there laboratory assays that growers can use to identify that? And well, then... unfortunately, I don't know that many places that will do it, but, yes, you can do it. I do it all the time here. You have to collect the, the feeder roots from that plant, whether it's grapes or beans or whatever, and you clear and stain the roots and find out if they're colonized. And there are ways that experimental people do this all the time. They actually quantify it. We posted a paper a long time ago on quantifying mycorrhizae, but the clearing and staining process allows you to detect the propagules of the mycorrhizal fungus or structures of the, that indicate mycorrhizae in roots, like hyphae, like spores, that tell you even to the point of saying no mycorrhizae, low mycorrhizae, medium, high, that would give an, a grower an idea that, in fact, mycorrhizae are there and probably functioning. I can't even tell you what labs will do that. I do know that people can quantify the population of spores, and there are commercial soils labs that do that sort of thing, but that's just number of spores. If you actually had roots that were colonized, you clear and stain them and find out if you see mycorrhizae. And as I say, I do that in my lab all the time. I mean, not all the time, but if somebody asked. And if people put material on, a product on, like a mycorrhizal product, anybody's product, and they get effects, the question that comes in my mind immediately is, did they actually form mycorrhizae? Or was the effect due to something else? Some of the products are actually late, late with fertilizer, so they're actually getting a fertilizer effect, and they didn't actually form mycorrhizae. Even when they see really striking results, uh, what happened to the mycorrhizal population? There are organic products one called that I can think of right now is called sea crop. They extract materials, organic materials from the ocean water and make a product called sea crop. They put it on, they get growth infects. Question is, did they actually encourage mycorrhizal fungi or some other beneficial system, microbial system? They all claim that they probably do, but there's no evidence of it. They right. could have that evidence, they just don't do it. I've actually volunteered for some of those people that have products like that to say, send me roots of the treated plants versus the control, and I can tell you if there are more mycorrhizae on the treated ones than the controls. Yeah, I'm imagining you haven't been taken up on that offer very often. No, exactly uh, right. There were tests being done in South Carolina, for example, on, I, I think it's, well, I can't remember what the crop was right now. I can't think of it. Well, it was a legume, actually. Well, did you actually, if it's a legume, did you actually, with that product, did you form more nodules that fix more nitrogen? Yes or no? More nodules or less nodules? What kind of nodules, too? But if you got more nodules when you used that product than if you didn't use that product, then you have some information. You can say our product stimulates the formation of nodules of rhizobium on this, maybe it was peanuts, for example. 
And then they get to the situation, you get more nodules formed of rhizobium in the presence of specific strains of mycorrhizal fungi than if you don't have that, my, that strain of mycorrhizal fungus. Paper we published in 1993, not appreciated by most people, surely not the niters and fixing people. If you don't have that combination of mycorrhizal plus rhizobium, you don't get the full bang. Something that we've observed many times is that when we apply inoculants of various types without mycorrhizae, we don't get the response that you do when you combine it with mycorrhizae. The same thing happened if you applied mycorrhizal fungi plus a plant growth-promoting rhizobacterium, PGPR. We published a paper that showed one of the first papers that's almost never cited because it was so early in the presence of mycorrhizae and, and this pseudomonad you actually had a change in the nutritional composition in the plant as a result of the combination that you didn't get if you were separate. This reminds me of an experience that we had uh, a couple of years ago with a, this was a spinach crop in California being irrigated with very saline irrigation water, very high mm -hmm. sodium level, very high chloride levels. Uh, it was in fact so high that the spinach crop was bitter and the leaf edges were burnt and the crop was, uh, I can't say that it was entirely unmarketable, but it was largely unmarketable, and yields were severely depressed because of the high sodium levels. And we were working with this bacterial inoculant that has been known to somehow sequester or lock up or tie up sodium levels. They no longer show up in the leaf tissue or in plant sap, and they no longer show up in the soil. And we've gotten some very nice responses. But in this particular case, the sodium levels were so high that even though the levels were dropping a little bit, we were not getting the response that we had seen in other areas and the crop was still challenged and so forth. Well, our consultant noticed that the one row of spinach right at the field edge was perfect. It looked really awesome and didn't have any leaf burning effect from the high sodium levels. It was planted right beside a row of carrots in the neighboring field. It was like 16 inch spacing between the rows, fairly closely together, and the carrots have been inoculated with mycorrhizae. So we repeated our experiments on the spinach where we put on this inoculant again and the biostimulant combined with mycorrhizae. And we went from getting very poor performance to getting very good performance. The sodium levels in the soil dropped dramatically. The spinach crop performed exceptionally well. We were able to produce full harvests for multiple cuttings after that and completely turn the situation around. And I find this particularly interesting because this is shifting a little bit now, I understand, but when we had this experience probably seven or eight years ago at this point, spinach is considered to be a crop that is not associated with mycorrhizae. And right. yet it still showed that pronounced positive response to the presence of mycorrhizae. What are your thoughts about that? Well, again, this to the question, were there actually mycorrhizae that, for whatever reason at this point, actually formed mycorrhizae with spinach? If there weren't any mycorrhizae formed there, but they were present because you inoculated, what did you inoculate with? What kind of inoculum was there? The inoculum of mycorrhizal fungi can contain many other organisms, some of which were originally associated with mycorrhizae when the pot culture was being grown. So you may be adding some beneficial organisms just because they were there in the inoculum. Now, That's I've actually point. heard that, that kind of a story before, and people say, well, I know I had to say, well, spinach doesn't form mycorrhizae, so that wasn't what was going on. You didn't right. form mycorrhizae. But you might have formed, and this is true in many, many cases, the inoculum that's formed in a pot culture system can contain many of these associates as the inoculum is being produced, and they are also added, as you know, in our own product, where you're adding a lot of organisms plus the mycorrhizae. If the spinach didn't form mycorrhizae, it also got a dose of all the other beneficial organisms that were associated with mycorrhizae back in the previous stage. There are so, other examples where, for example, tomato wilt. This is an example in Japan. When they planted onions in amongst or next to the tomato plants in a greenhouse situation where they're growing greenhouse tomatoes, they didn't have fusarium wilt anymore. What did the onion bring to the system to change the soil biology in such a way that you didn't get wilt? They actually created a suppressive soil situation there by adding onions in amongst the tomatoes.
you just change the whole biology. I mean, there's also the business of of what we call nurse crops. You can actually form mycorrhiza on one plant and then have it be then transferred from that crop onto the corn plant, for example, in strip planting situations. It could be happening, but there's not much documentation of it. I know it was happening in Colorado. I actually suggested they do that, but they had strip till plant corn, but they had rye before, and there's a potential that mycorrhizal fungus vegetatively moved through the soil, got onto the corn roots earlier than otherwise, and you got an increase in yield because they formed mycorrhiza early enough to show some benefit. This raises an interesting question. It's getting to be fairly well understood that if you want to have good mycorrhizal colonization shortly after planting, then putting on soluble phosphorus fertilizers in the furrow as a starter is probably a really bad idea. Right. And the question that I've been asked occasionally when growers realize their mistake shortly after the beginning of the season, they ask the question, can I inoculate mycorrhizae when the plant is already six inches or eight inches tall in the case of the corn plant? Is it possible if they've applied that soluble phosphorus fertilizer how much does that delay colonization? Is it possible to re-inoculate later in the season and still have an effect on the crop if they're able to get it down into the soil profile? Well, the potential is there for sure. The question is, what happened to the phosphorus that they put on? Did it get tied up? The phosphorus fixing capacity of the soil is really critical. If it got tied up and was no longer in the soluble form, then adding inoculum later and washing it down enough, and the spores are large, they don't wash very really readily. But if you could get it down to the root system, yes, there's potential to form mycorrhizae after the phosphorus is already tied up. The soluble phosphorus that you put on, I mean, in your soils, I don't know what the phosphorus fixing capacity is, but in our areas out here, it got tied up pretty fast. In many agricultural soils that I have experience with, phosphorus applications are usually tied up in some cases in days, but most often certainly in weeks and occasionally months. Yeah, particularly I, I was talking going to say, we've done that experiment, and it was days. Yeah. It's, it's way fast. If most people realize how much money they waste on phosphorus applications, they would stop oh, spending money pretty quickly because it's a complete waste right. or largely a waste. Yeah, I don't know any examples of people that have actually tried to do that post-inoculation because they realize they put too much phosphorus on if it's in a soil situation, the phosphorus fixing capacity is really the critical thing. If you're in a potting mix, there's no phosphorus fixing capacity in potting mixes, almost. It almost goes straight through. Then you would stay in the pot. Well, that's another important point. If these people are going to do transplants, then they could be inoculating with all kinds of things onto the transplant so that they're preloaded when they go out into the field. After we talked the other day, I got a paper that came to me on my computer, and it's not a new paper, it's 2018. Here's the title, Biocontrol Measures Against Onion Basal Rot, this is Fusarium, Onion Basal Rot Incidents Under Natural Field Conditions. They tried two species of trichoderma, one Pseudomonas and one Bacillus, and they got much better control of the disease by inoculating the seedlings before they transplanted, by dipping them in these suspensions, transplanting, they got better disease than they got with the chemical that they used to compare to. That's the I very concept that's... we're talking about here. If you're going to do transplants or bulbs or whatever, cuttings, inoculate the transplant before it goes into the field. We actually published a paper. I, I keep referring to these papers, and I'm sorry, because they point to the, the idea that pre-inoculation with mycorrhizal fungi is the most efficient way you can deliver the, the fungi to the plant system and have it on there when it goes out in the field, whether it's grapes or it's onions or it's whatever. Geraniums didn't really make any difference. Pre-inoculation prevents transplant shock, whatever that amounts to. So you have more plants to survive. Even under salty conditions, we have a paper on very high salt conditions and pre-inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, they tolerated the salt and they didn't if they didn't didn't have mycorrhizae, just the transplant shock itself, pre-inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi geraniums, transplant, there's all kinds of things why you have transplant shock and the plants don't go very well if you hadn't pre-inoculated. There's a paper published on that. 
So all and, of this points to the idea if we could pre-inoculate transplants or a propagule, whatever it's going to be, even seed, if that were efficient with the organism that you want, then that's what they ought to do. I mean, back to the systemic approach, that would be the one common thing that they ought to do. There's a whole the, business of seed priming. Seed priming, you, are, you I know you know this already. You could do seed priming with things like polyethylene glycol that will change the osmotic potential, but you can also do seed priming with antagonistic organisms. And if you're worried about pythium damping off right away, you can pre-inoculate the seed and prevent that from happening because it happens within hours after the seed are transplanted. As soon as the seed starts to germinate, they become infected, pre-emergent damping off or post-emergent damping off. But you get protection by inoculating the seed. I don't know how many the, people are doing that. I don't know how many people do seed priming, but the idea of doing it at the same time you're doing seed priming to get uniform seed germination is a good thing. I almost never talk, well, I try to never talk about products in our interviews, in our podcast interviews, but I think a lot of our listeners would appreciate knowing that the product that we've developed called BioCoat Gold uses Dr. Linderman's mycorrhizal fungi and also a lot of these antagonistic organisms that we're speaking about. So I've observed a lot of these effects in the field, and I didn't expect to quite get into this conversation when we started here, but I think it's important to just let everyone know. I know many of you have experienced the incredible effectiveness that this product can have on managing some of this, these diseases, and these are some of the principal interactions that are going on behind it. So I think there's a key phrase that you mentioned, Bob, when you were speaking about the first paper you mentioned a moment ago regarding the onion basil rot. You used the word effectiveness as compared to a fungicide. And we have adopted a model of agriculture today where, for some reason, we just expect that fungicides or insecticides are the best tools that are out there. They're the easy tools. They're the tools that we're familiar with. And immediately in our mind, we, when we start thinking about biocontrols, they get compared against the fungicide. How does a biocontrol compare against the fungicide? Our own experience in the field has been that in many cases, not in all cases, but in the great majority of cases, the biocontrols are actively more effective than the fungicides. In fact, we just had an experience recently, the conversation we had a couple of days ago regarding phytophthora and peppers, where the chemical sales rep acknowledged directly to the grower and said, the product that we are selling you to control phytophthora doesn't work. It's not effective. And yet, it's what is being sold. It's what we've come to expect as being effective to control a certain disease. So I'd love to hear your professional perspective as a scientist who has looked at these things. What are typical effectiveness rates of biocontrols as compared to fungicides and products in a jug? Oh. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a big one. But, you know, the strategies paper that I referred to earlier, we have a quote in there that I, I'm going to use to answer the question. This came from actually Jim Cook and Ken Baker. Quote is, biological control is not inherently spectacular. Its successes tend to be overlooked or attributed to other factors. And the, the spectacular responses that you could get from a chemical, because it's going to be short or sometimes short-lived, or it just don't occur, whereas the biological systems eventually will give you the best outcome. But they're not spectacular because they don't happen instantly. That's the instant gratification of using an insecticide or, or a fungicide. If it works, you see results. You don't really necessarily see the results of biological systems until the end, end of the crop, or later, like ash burners. His trees recovered. Well, it didn't happen overnight as a whole system, but his trees did recover as they developed healthy roots to support the tree. The same thing could be happening in peppers, but you're talking about an annual crop, so you need to get started earlier in the system. And chemicals, I mean, even fumigants don't necessarily get to all the places in the soil, so if you drench with something like ritamil, you may not get it to where the propagules of the pathogen are, so you, you may get ineffectiveness for that, not to mention resistance of the pathogen to that particular material, which is known. So I don't know how, the, how to compare because we don't have 
one-on-one, I've got a field where I put biological control systems on versus I put chemicals on and say, well, what's the percentage take? In your blog, you've referred to a lot of the treatments that have gone on through the years, and all. we don't know what a real healthy-looking plant even looks like anymore because yields are down and the leaves are smaller and they don't look like they're performing very well. As a result of long-term applications of chemicals, whether it's herbicides or other chemicals that change the biology in such a way that you don't get the performance, the plant doesn't grow normally anymore, or what we used to have, what you used to see, you don't see anymore. I'm really grateful to be alive in this day at this moment in time to be able to help bring about a change in how we grow food and how we manage our agriculture. And uh, at the same time, I also would have loved to be present to see some of the fields and orchards that I see in old photos. I have, um, well, my father helps, uh, worked on an orchard in his teens, this is probably 40 years ago now, where they had old apple trees that were three and a, two and a half to three feet in diameter with branches on the, on the first layer of branches where the branches were 20 inches to two feet in diameter and the trees were 40 feet in diameter altogether. And they had no diseases. They sprayed right. no fungicides. They sprayed no insecticides because they had these incredibly large, robust root systems and they had the entire system working. So obviously that's not a system that is transferable today with our labor environment and everything else. But I think there are still many things that we can learn from the way that crops were grown in that era without any fungicide and insecticide applications. My father had a big garden too. He wasn't a farmer, but he had a big garden and he never put fungicides on anything. And he grew the best corn, the best strawberries. But I can remember going down to the docks with him where they load salmon heads on in his trailer as he worked. He worked for the post office. Come home at night with a trailer load of fish heads. We took the, the salmon cheeks out for dinner, and the rest of it got buried under the strawberry in rows. And you didn't believe the strawberries he grew. But he never put a fungicide on anything in his garden. And that's the kind of thing that we we kind of strive right now to get back to. There are so many limitations that occur. I mean, it's like organic matter. You need to put more organic matter in your soil. Well, where do I get the organic matter? Well, it's produced in three or four states over. So there's a shipment cost. Transporting these materials to where the big farmers can put it on a field and the volumes that need to be there to do the good, that's almost impossible. This reminds me of an important topic that we haven't yet spoken about, and that is the potential to produce your own organic matter locally on your own fields. I'm passionate about the potential of plants to increase their photosynthesis to much higher levels and to sequester a lot more carbon simply as a result of having more efficient photosynthesis. What is the impact of mycorrhizal colonization on photosynthetic efficiency? Well, you you had that on your list, and I was glad you asked it because... There is a paper, papers from, uh, if you look at the, in the mycorrhizal literature, Gabe Bethlen Falvey was a scientist who worked on mycorrhizae. He was in California, transferred it into my unit up here before he retired. They did work on increased photosynthesis with mycorrhizae compared to plants with, that didn't have it. So there, there definitely is an increase in photosynthetic capacity with mycorrhizae compared to without. Now, how that translates into the field situation, how many mycorrhizae, I don't have an answer to that. Early in our conversation, you mentioned the possible food sources that could be used to enhance fungal microbial communities. And you mentioned, you made mention of chitin as one possible food source. And actually, my, my thoughts go in two di- different directions. One is, what is the potential of using chitin as a food source to develop mycorrhizal and other fungal populations. And kind of related to that, uh, as soon as I started asking that question, another question popped into my mind. We also haven't spoken about the impact of mycorrhizae on nematode control, which I think is kind of connected to that. Well, there is good literature on nematode control. In the presence of mycorrhizae, nematode populations or activity is definitely decreased. So that's there's a really good a lot of evidence of that. As far as adding chitin to support specific or groups of organisms, they do support actinomycetes if you add chitin, but I don't know anything about the mycorrhizal part of it. 
don't know any study that's actually been done where to say add chitin, you get more mycorrhizae. It's something that could be done, but I just don't think that it has been done specifically. It gets back to the, if you added chitin and you get certain responses, I have a colleague here that just asked me that question the other day. Well, we had chitin. We did some other people did an experiment up in um, in Oregon here, where they added crab shell, and crab shells being added into some premix kind of things. And it, I saw the examples in that experiment where roots were actually stimulated by the presence of crab shell in the medium. What was what caused that? Is really not known. Did we change the population of anything uh, microbiologically uh, other than chitinase producing actinomycetes? I don't know anybody that knows the answer to that. And I don't know about for mycorrhizal fungi. If you added chitin, do you get more mycorrhizae? Don't know the answer to that. But again, if you did that experiment, that's one more step to take, and you would have the answer. Take the roots of the plants that are treated versus the ones that aren't treated and clear and stain them and find out what the level of mycorrhiza is. Rather simple. It's not done. Not usually done. I've reviewed a lot of papers where I say, did you actually look at mycorrhiza on your roots? Well, no, we didn't look. Well, <laughs> you can talk about the effects of mycorrhiza, but can you really attribute that to mycorrhiza or their, and or their associates? This all happens. It doesn't happen with mycorrhiza by itself most often. It's a, it's a team effort. Which is the whole mycorrhizosphere concept. So let's let's expand a little bit on nematode treatment. Is does mycorrhizal association and the whole teamwork that comes with mycorrhizal association provide enough nematode control that it can be an effective treatment for root knot nematodes and other similar nematodes? I, I believe it could. I, I actually couldn't tell you that it's been done. Uh, and I have to think back as some papers on nematode suppression basically have looked at even the products that were out there that were chitin-based, looked at uh, changes in, in the behavior of the nematode, that are fewer eggs laid, uh, chitin in the surface eggs, you know, all the effects were on the nematode per se, without knowing whether there were other associated organisms that were with the mycorrhizal fungi that actually did those sorts of things. There are people in Riverside, California, that are looking at bacteria that are nematode suppressing in various ways. And what they don't include in their systems are where their mycorrhizae present. They just looked at one part of it, but they may have associated their added organism with mycorrhizal fungi, and it was a team effort. They just don't ever look at the other part of the team. Um, I've not been to meetings uh, out here for the years. I'm not going to so many meetings anymore, but people in Riverside have done some really good work uh, on, and I can't even tell you which bacteria they're using, but they find some that are suppressive to nematodes. And when they say suppressive to nematodes, that may mean the the reproductive capacities is influenced, fewer eggs laid, fewer eggs hatched, fewer... Uh, First stage nematodes, those are the kinds of things that were majored in a plant with mycorrhiza versus ones that didn't have mycorrhizae. But if they're just looking at the bacterial part of it, looking for antagonistic bacteria against nematodes, they leave out the mycorrhiza part of it. So you don't know if they're involved or not. Or if they help the bacteria that they added do its job, they may have teamed up. Bob, well, you've shared lots of wisdom and knowledge that you've gained over the years. I'm sure there's many conversations more that we could have like this, but there's one important question that I want to get to. What is something that you wish all farmers knew? Uh, you, you put that on your list and I thought about it a lot. <laughs> I, I would like to know, I'd like farmers to know that, that biological options are available that they should consider biological things as at least equally and maybe preferentially over chemical treatments. And until farmers begin to ask the kind of questions that you're asking and you're asking it sort of for them, uh, we're not going to get those kinds of answers. And that kind of means that there have to be more people to step up and try to get the answers to those questions. And unfortunately, 
those people are few and far between. We have actually done away in the U.S., we've done away with mycorrhiza people. They, they don't exist anymore. Uh, the USDA, uh, at one time I, I had a meeting of all the mycorrhiza people in the, of the ARS in the country. We all got together and talked. Most of those people are retired uh, or were closed out. They don't do mycorrhiza stuff anymore. And that's unfortunate because I, I would like to see the biological control approach uh, favored as opposed to chemical approaches. But the, And it's shifting that way, but it's taking a while. I mean, there are more products that are out there right now, but the products are out there simply from a market point of view. They find these organisms sometimes based on really flimsy evidence, and not real field evidence, uh, and in vitro petri dish assay, which I do too. I see these organisms all the time. I isolate the bacteria. I try to put them on and, te and test against the pathogens that I'm working with specifically, and they're, they're pathogens in the nursery, things like cylindrocladium, rhizoctonia, phytophthora, pythiums. By the way, pythium antagonists are really hard to come by. I... I rarely find a product that re really works against the pythium isolates that I have. And it's because pythiums are so fast, rhizoctonias are so fast, and both of those organisms, by the way, grow vegetatively through soil. So it's really hard to find organisms that will slow them down. I keep looking for them, but I haven't found a lot yet. So uh, that's, I guess, the answer to my question. I'd like farmers to consider biological systems. Bob, what is a topic that you would like to speak about more often to growers, but you don't because they sense they you sense they may not be ready to consider it? Uh, what topics? Well, again, I kind of answered the same question. I don't think most of the the discussions that are going on right now don't have enough to do with biological systems. I mean, you're kind of you're an exception in that you bring the subject up in everything that you do. You can go back to all kinds of questions about cover crops and organic amendments and biological products that are added. Again, it gets down to if they aren't as spectacular or the potential results are not so spectacular, their farmers are not likely to to go there. I'd like them to be more tenacious than that and stay with it until they figure it out. I gave a talk one time on learning from all the mistakes I've made. <laughs> I did this experiment. Why didn't it work? What went wrong? You learn a lot from your mistake. Why didn't it work? Why didn't mycorrhiza form on my onions? Well, it's because you did such and such. You put it in the candy spreader and spread it all over the field, but not put it where it needed to be. Or you did it too late. But if you analyze all the mistakes that people make, if they made mistakes, I tried that, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? How can we change the approach so that it would work? The, and your system, you have all kinds of consultants and farm advisors and things that are out there. Uh, and the farmers are seeing those people some. But more than likely, the, the people that they see the most are chemical salesmen. That's kind of sad in a way, but it's probably true. And you can confirm that. I could be wrong about that, but that's been my experience. The growers out here, they see chemical salesmen coming around with a product more often than they see somebody coming around selling a biological. It's certainly it's still the mainstream, that's for sure. Bob, I want to say thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom and the insights that you have experienced, and I look forward to having more conversations like this in the future. I would be happy to do that, John. Really, I would. I'd like to talk about this stuff, but I'd also like to see a vehicle to communicate any of this to growers that need it. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data 
knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.